Welcome back to Earth Science. This week we start reviewing the materials that are in the textbook. But before we get to that point, I want to go over again how you need to complete the, the chapter modules. First of all, before you even log on to Blackboard, read that chapter. And read it closely. Take notes if you want. Underline in the book if you want. When you enter Blackboard, open the chapter module and complete the interactive lecture. You should notice that this interactive lecture is different from the one of, from last week. Hopefully as we go through the semester, I'll become a little bit better about learning this new technology and have even better interactive lectures. After that lecture, read or complete any of the other links or activities that are within that module. At the end of that module is going to be the timed quiz, but I highly recommend before you take that timed quiz, read the chapter again. It's going to be very important to read the chapter and know what's in that chapter because even though that time quiz is open book, the time is going to be relatively short. And that's because I don't want you to take the quiz and then start reading the textbook. I want you to have read it and studied the material in advance. Now because this is an open book timed quiz, keep in mind that you have some advantages. If you've already read the chapter a couple times, you know where in the chapter certain material is. That's going to help you out in a big way. Also keep in mind there is an index and there is a glossary in the back of this textbook. In some cases, that's going to be helpful as well. Now this first chapter is really an overview about what is earth science. And as you can tell from the syllabus, earth science is a very broad discipline that includes four major areas. Geology, oceanography, meteorology, and astronomy. Basically, it's a study of rocks and water and air and then everything away from Earth. And even though it's divided up into these four categories, you'll see that we have some significant c components of physics that are involved. Some chemistry, some biology, some math, and it even includes some of the social sciences. However, for the most part, because this is an intro level class, we'll be talking about the basics of geology, oceanography, meteorology, and astronomy. Now, in this first section of the book, it's going to be all geology. Geology can be split into two major disciplines, physical geology and historical geology. Physical geology is describing what is there and how does it work. And hopefully you recognize those as two of the questions that science asks. What is there and how does it work? Now, the third question that science asks is, how, how did it come to be this way? That's the question that is asked by historical geology. So as we think about earth science in general, we can start asking other questions like, who cares about geology? Well, hopefully to some degree we all care about geology, in part because we get natural resources from the earth. And that could be oil from the oil well that's being shown on the screen right now. It could be gravel that's used to help uh, pave the roads that you drove that you drove on today. It could be many different kinds of resources. It could be metal resources. It could be fossil fuels. It could be uh, non-metal resources called aggregates, such as sand, um, gravel, stone. Now, in your discussion for this first part of the class, you'll be answering questions about essentially why do you care about geology? What kind of earth materials, physical earth materials, have you used today? And which ones are more important than others? So as we go through these multiple components of what is earth science, that next one was oceanography. So why should we care about the oceans? Well, obviously, we get a lot of food from the oceans, and there are many cultures that depend almost exclusively on the oceans for their diet. But even if they're not relying on the water for food, they are relying on water for transportation, and people rely on water for elimination of waste. So throughout history, most major civilizations have been located along major bodies of water. And if you look at a map of modern cities, you'll see that's still the case. So we should care about the oceans. Now what about the atmosphere? Now in this particular slide, you, we have a landslide in El Salvador. 
that wiped out a swath of town. And you can see that this landslide completely obliterated all the homes uh, in the area where the landslide occurred. In this case, you had a hillside that the geological material that was very loose. And then the atmosphere released a lot of water into that hillside. So if you have loose material and a lot of water, that water lubricates the hillside and a catastrophe happens. So now we can think not just about the natural resources that the earth provides, but also the natural disasters. So in cases like this, why would people want to live in that village if they can look uphill and see that might be a problem when it rains? Or we can have an example closer to home. Why would people choose to live in the Gulf Coast of the United States when we know hurricanes are going to hit and they're going to do a lot of damage? Well, that introduces a social component. So why doesn't everyone move out of New Orleans? Because their family's there, because their jobs are there, because of the culture, because it's a unique place to live, because they enjoy it. So most people are willing to put up with a little bit of natural disasters, a little bit of uncertainty for other reasons, for reasons that are harder to quantify. Now the last of those four areas is what about astronomy? And this one may not be quite as obvious, but astronomy is probably one of the earliest sciences. So here we have a picture of Stonehenge and some stars. Stonehenge in the United Kingdom is probably an ancient observatory. So why would ancient people care about observing the stars? Well, if you can track the stars, you know when to plant crops. You can keep track of seasons. So this is critical because if you plant crops too soon, you can have a freeze and lose everything. If you plant too late, you may not have enough of a growing season. But there are other reasons to be interested in earth science. One, because it can be cool. This is a photograph of the Grand Canyon. And if you're interested in geology, first of all, you have to leave the state of Illinois. You have to go out west to see things like the Grand Canyon to see places in Utah like Arches National Monument because it actually means more if you look at this and can understand from a scientific perspective how this thing formed. It becomes just a little bit more amazing. But even if you don't make it out west, go outside when it's warmer, lay down and watch the clouds there is an incredible calming sensation that occurs when you simply watch the clouds. And when you, again, when you understand what's happening, it puts it into a new perspective. Now, I've mentioned natural disasters and natural resources as ways that our physical environment affects us. Another reason to study earth science is to see how we affect our physical environment. And we'll see a lot of those examples throughout this class, um, such as the way that humans impact climate change. But this one, I think, is a really neat photo. This is the Darvaza well in Turkmenistan. In 1971, Russian geologists were drilling for oil. They thought there, were oil, there was oil right underneath this spot. They drilled down. Instead of oil, they hit a pocket of natural gas. They released the gas and the entire drilling platform plummeted into this hole that's about the size of a football field. So again, this happened in 1971 and they decided that this natural gas coming off could be dangerous. It could suffocate people if you got close to it. So they lit it on fire. The fire was started intentionally because they assumed the fire would burn for maybe a couple weeks and the gas would be gone. That was 1971. Today, more than four decades later, that fire is still burning. So even in small ways, small things like a single spark can have some major impacts on our physical landscape. Now your book talks about four major spheres of Earth. The geosphere, the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, and the biosphere. The geosphere is all the rocky material, 
Hydrosphere means the oceans and all the water. Atmosphere, all the gases. Um, Biospheres, everything that's alive. So when I look at these, I think the easy way to keep these uh, separated is geosphere is solids, hydrosphere is all the liquids, which in the case of Earth is almost exclusively water. Atmosphere is all the gases, whether that's in the atmosphere or in smaller pockets deep within ice or deep within soil. And then biosphere, which will be a combination of solids, liquids, and gases to create uh, various forms of life. Now I mentioned that air doesn't have to be within the atmosphere, but can be within small pockets of ice or soil. Now I like that, the example of soil because here we have a little bit of geosphere. So we, in this case, about 45% minerals in a typical handful of soil. There's some hydrosphere, there's water in it, there's some atmosphere, there's air in it, and there is some biosphere. So soil has, in this particular case, 5% organic matter. Now in the case of soil, much of that soil is going to be, so most of that organic material is going to be dead material. It's going to be called hummus. But if we can increase that amount of hummus, we actually can have a big impact on that area. So for every 1% increase in organic matter, and that can be decaying leaves, decaying grass, the soil retains a lot more water per acre. So all of a sudden, by making simple modifications of our physical environment, of our soil, in the case of the biotic component, that biosphere component, we can impact the ability of soil to absorb water and to retain water, which then means we can influence the area's susceptibility to flooding. So we start to see that there's a lot of connections, and I'll come back to those connections in just a minute. Now this first section of the textbook, as I mentioned, is on the geosphere. It's on geology. Now most people consider the earliest aspect, the aspects of geology to have begun about 7,000 years ago with large-scale mining. And when I say mining at 7,000 years ago, I mean stone, and more commonly, mud. So mud was accumulated, patched with straw to create basic bricks. Some people may argue that the earliest mining began many hundreds of thousands of years earlier when primitive people were looking for certain rocks in order to make arrowheads or axe heads. If you ever try to make an arrowhead, you, you'll realize that not every stone you pick up is going to work. So you have to be very selective. You have to know what to look for. So it could be argued that that earliest, that earliest mining began with the selection of rocks for creating arrowheads. Now I want to go back just a little bit and talk about some Greek philosophers, Xenophanes and Aristotle. And so when I say the Greek philosophers, I mean philosophy in the natural history sense, the very old school sense. In other words, they were interested in exploring the basic questions of science. What is there? How does it work? And how did it come to be this way? Xenophanes and Aristotle were both trying to, dis to explain why they were able to find fossil fish and fossil shells in rock layers that were high up within the mountains. Far away from any oceans, far away from any standing water. Superficially, it didn't make any sense. Now, Xenophanes described the entire planet as a bunch of settled mud. So if you take a bottle of water and you pour in some mud and you pour in some sand and you pour in some gravel and you shake it all up and then you sit it down in front of you, the first thing that's going to happen is those big pieces, the gravel is going to coat the bottom and then the sand will settle out and then you'll slowly have that fine stuff, the mud settling out on top of that in layers. So that's how Xenophanes thought the earth was formed. And as that mud was settling out, it was trapping fossil fish and those shells in what used to be an ocean. Okay. Now Aristotle had a different interpretation. Aristotle's interpretation was the fish must have been alive within the rock, the shells were alive within the rock, and as soon as you broke open the rock, the fish died and turned into fossils. Okay. Did he see that happen? Well, absolutely no. 
he did not see that happen. Uh, but in spite of that, Aristotle's ideas were accepted for a long time. And if you look at these two names, Xenophanes and Aristotle, you're probably familiar with Aristotle, and you may not have heard of the name Xenophanes. So Xenophanes had the better idea, but his ideas weren't accepted for, in fact, a couple thousands of years. So the next few slides are going to blitz through uh, some aspects of the geosphere. And we will cover all these aspects in more detail in later chapters. The inside of the Earth can be divided into layers based on the chemical composition or based on the physical properties. If it's the chemical composition, we have this very dense core and then a high density rock layer that's outside of that and a low density rock layer that's that's the outermost so we have the crust that's the outermost the mantle which is high density rock and then the core which is essentially all metal and that's even denser than that high density rock this happened because when the earth was formed everything was all jumbled together but again think about what happened in Xenophanes idea of the settling of the earth. Those big particles, that gravel, settled out first. Well, in reality, if we look at the earth, the real dense stuff migrated to the center of the earth. The very light stuff, the low density um, materials, essentially floated on top. So if we look at the layers of the earth by chemical composition, we have an outermost crust, and that's where we live, a very thick mantle, and then a core made of made up of iron and nickel. The other way of looking at the inside of the earth is by the physical properties. And so your textbook talked about a couple physical properties of a couple of the layers and we'll talk more about the other layers uh, later. But for this for this lecture focus on the two outermost layers as determined by physical properties. So there's the lithosphere and that includes all of the crust and the uppermost part of the mantle. So the lithos means rock. Sphere means it's an area. And so it's that rock-like, rigid, solid part of the crust and the uppermost mantle. Now the other layer, the next layer that your book mentioned was the asthenosphere. Now that's part of the mantle, but it's not all of the mantle that's left. And it's under a lot of pressure. So it has the same chemical composition as the bottom part of the lithosphere, but it's hot. It's under pressure. And so it is somewhat of a solid, but your book mentions it's still mobile. Think about the asphenosphere as being Play-Doh. Asthenos basically means a plastic-like consistency. And so if you take Play-Doh, it looks like a solid, but if you apply pressure, it's going to move a little bit. Now, if you look at the outside of the Earth, there's a couple major areas that your book talked about. And I'm not going to talk about the oceanic parts in this lecture because we have a huge section of that later on in the class. Your book pointed out in yellow these young mountain belts. And what we're going to see is that these young mountain belts are going to match up very nicely with the boundaries of lithospheric plates, where you have plates coming together. If you have lithospheric plates coming together, you have mountain building, you have earthquakes, and in some cases you're going to have volcanic activity. So any place where you see yellow, you're going to have a lot of shaking. The old mountain belts in purple are usually not going to have much earthquake activity. They will not have any kind of volcanic activity. They tend to be very stable, although because they are being eroded, you can have some landslides and you can have slumping that causes minor earthquakes. The most stable parts of any continents are the shields. So in red you have that Canadian shield, the Greenland shield, or Orinoco shield, and the Brazilian shield. These are the very, very old stable parts of any continent. The next most stable are going to be the platforms. Platforms are shown in gray. And those are areas where the rocks of the shield are covered up with sedimentary rocks. And we'll talk more uh, in the next lecture about the difference between 
igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, and sedimentary rocks. Now I want you to know one more term that's not in your textbook, so flag this one, and that's craton. Craton refers to the combined area of the shields and the platforms. So the cratons in general tend to be very calm, stable areas. You, if you live in central Illinois, you live on a platform, which is part of a craton, which means we are not likely to have major earthquakes, at least not many major earthquakes in this area. And if you know a little bit about the geologic history of this area, I will give you a heads up. I'm going to talk about some exceptions to that rule in a couple, in a couple chapters. Now we can start combining things in new ways. So we'll start talking about the geosphere in the next few chapters. We'll then start talking about the hydrosphere and atmosphere and biosphere. But it's important to realize that all these things work together. For instance, when I talked about that landslide in El Salvador, it was a combination of things happening. It was the geosphere being unstable on that hillside. It was the atmosphere releasing a lot of water into the hydrosphere portion that caused that landslide. So there's lots of interaction and there's constant interactions. And again, don't forget that there's a social science component. We are part of the Earth system. So I like the fact that this particular illustration, it's not taken from your textbook, but this illustration includes the anthroposphere. It includes the fact that humans have an impact on life, on the, the sky, on land, on the water, and all those different areas have an impact on us.